We're going to be in John 21. If you have your Bibles today, I hope that you do. You can turn to the passage of Scripture there. No one in this room has failed greater than him. No one. Your shortcomings might equal his, but they're not greater. Peter's sin was as bad as it could get. And it wasn't his first time. It wasn't his first failure, but clearly this has more of a magnitude than, than all the others. But the others were bad too. He, he had this tendency of not being able to understand what Jesus said. Jesus would have to repeat himself, explain it to him a little bit more. He had been one of the ones holding the children back from Jesus that, <clears throat> that caused Jesus, the text says, to be indignant with the disciples. He had the opportunity to walk on water, but not the faith to hold him there. And yet at the same time, he had the arrogance to actually have a discussion of whether or not he was the greatest uh, among all the disciples. He actually rebuked Jesus, which caused Jesus to say, get behind me, Satan, when Jesus needed him most. He fell asleep. And yet none of those failures come even close to comparing to the fact that he denied Jesus three times when he said he wouldn't. Jesus had predicted it, and he in his arrogance said, oh, I would never do that. Yeah, the, the rest of these guys might fail you like that, Lord, but, but I'll never fail you in that way. And then he did and then his friend died. And in his mind, it was over. It's one thing to fail a friend. We've all done that. But to fail a friend in a way that you can't make it right. You can't go back and say, I'm sorry, and now Jesus is dead and Peter has failed. Can you sense what was going through his heart? And yet, we know the rest of the story. Jesus rose again. And while Peter had to be overwhelmed with joy over that fact and, and excitement for his friend and knowledge of what that meant for the kingdom and the message that would push on out from that, he, he still had to have these questions in the back of his mind, and, and probably not even a question, but probably a, a certainty within his own mind that, that yes, the kingdom will be, move forward, Jesus is going to clearly be Lord, but I've lost my chance. And he had to think that his failure was so great that he could never come back. I don't know if he was there when Jesus appeared to the disciples in the room. Maybe he was, and, and he was just over to the side, still associated, but so shamed that he was separated, even in a small room. Maybe he wasn't there. But, but we do know in John 21 that the text tells the stories about the disciples being out fishing. Now, a lot of commentators like to make a big deal out of this, that Peter had gone back to his old way of life, and maybe that was going on, or maybe Peter was just hungry. And so they were out fishing, they weren't having much success, and as the sun began to rise, they saw this figure up on the beach, and the figure called out to them and said, hey, are y'all having any, any success? And they cried out, no, and the guy said, well, cast your nets on the other side, and when you get so hopeless, you'll, you'll take random advice from somebody standing on the beach. And so they cast the nets on the other side, and the fish began to team out. And one of the disciples in that moment recognized the miraculousness of the moment and says, that's the Lord. And Peter now so maybe overcome by all his guilt, but yet still longing to be with his friend, now excited about the resurrection. Uh, Peter, having been separated from his friend from so long, now almost in a Forrest Gump, now seeing uh, Captain Dan sort of way, doesn't even take time for the boat to get in. He just dives in and starts swimming toward Jesus. It's a beautiful picture of repentance, I think of returning back to God, of not caring what everybody else thinks, of, of, of so desiring to be right with God that it doesn't matter. You don't have to wait to do it in the right way. You just dive in and start swimming toward Jesus. If you don't know what to do today, dear friend, just dive in and start swimming toward Jesus. The rest of the disciples get all the fish. They get up on the shore. And it's there that we have one of the most soft, beautiful, seemingly minor pictures in all the Bible. Jesus, the creator of the universe, started a fire. 
Notice this. He started the fire, we assume, long before the fish were ever caught. And they bring the fish to Jesus, and He cooks them up and has breakfast. When we preached on this passage six years ago, we, we took just that story and said, isn't it just like Jesus to make Himself known through both the miraculous and the mundane? That He can use both? He can use the power. He can use the flash. He can use the show. And yet, He can just as simply use breakfast to show His character and His loving kindness and His nature. And so, whether you're working miracles today or simply cooking lunch, you can bring glory and honor to God right where you are. And as he's cooking breakfast, we pick up the story beginning in verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. So he said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said it to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This was said to him to show by which kind of death was to glorify God. And after saying this to him, he said, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the the one who had been reclining at the table close to him and had had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? And when Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? We're in this series called Back to Faith, and we're working with the the basic image that that generally speaking, the great temptation from us, for us is, is not to run from God, even though some do. Uh, generally, a, a traumatic event in life happens or something like that causes a great deal of emotion, then we run in anger from God. But for the vast majority of us in this room, that's not a danger, it's not a threat. Our danger, our threat is that we will slowly drift from Him, uh, that we'll, we will fail to, to put the proper disciplines in, in our lives, we'll fail to stick close to Jesus and what we're doing, and, and slowly over time, without any intention of our own, we will just slowly begin to drift away from what we know to be true and right, and from who we want to be and who God wants us to be, until uh, maybe a month has passed, or six months, or a year, or a decade, and the next thing you know, we don't even know who God is anymore. We're uncertain. We're uncertain if He will even welcome us back, if we want to even come back. And so the question is, how do you get back to faith? If you've drifted away, how do you get back to faith? And last week we looked at what was the, the short road back to God, that the good news is if you can drift for decades and that's fine. There, uh, there is an escape hatch that can get you back to God in, in almost a, a near immediacy, and that escape hatch is repentance that you own what you have done, that you recognize it, and, and yet you dig deeper behind it, not just recognizing the bad action, but you get into those beliefs, into those desires, and, and you return back to God by recognizing your own sin, by calling it out, by naming it, and by bringing it to Him, asking for His forgiveness, knowing that He is good and faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. That repentance takes place. And yet I think if we just stop right there, If all we do is that right there, I think there will still be a tension. There will still be a rub. Because while we will be close to God, and while while in His eyes we will be back with Him, until you and I feel restored, until we feel the love of God within our own lives and truly believe what He says to be true about us, we still won't have that close connection with Jesus that we want. I think that was the story of Peter here. You can almost see a a visible sign of repentance by him diving in and swimming back to Jesus. And yet, I can't help but think that as they're eating breakfast, there was still a tension on the beach that day. You've experienced it in small ways. There's been a relational rub between you and somebody else. 
uh, maybe it's you and, and your wife there in the house, or you and a coworker, you and a boss, or you and a friend. Something, something has occurred, and, and there's tension now that's there. And maybe you were clearly in the wrong, or maybe they were clearly in the wrong, or maybe you both think each other was wrong. But, uh, but for whatever the situation, there's a tension that's there. And maybe you know that there was an assignment that was supposed to be done, and, and, and you weren't able to do it, and your boss knows it, and so you know it, and your boss knows it, and, and yet there's a birthday party at lunch. So you're sitting at the table, and you know the conversation's coming at some point, and there's just this tension. Do you, do you speak to her or not? Does she speak to you? Just that tension that's there. Can you feel it between Peter and Jesus? Can you feel what Peter would be thinking in that moment, having failed Jesus, and, and yet there he is? can't help but wonder if on occasion Peter would just find himself staring at Jesus, and then Jesus would look over here, and Peter would duck his eyes away. And that tension is there. What I love about this story is notice how that tension is broken. It's broken by Jesus. He ain't afraid. He's not, he's not scared. There's not conversations that Jesus goes, oh, I don't want to have that. That's Kevin that's afraid, not Jesus. And, and, and so whether they, they begin to walk down the beach alone or, or just maybe whether they, once they got in the conversation, they begin to walk uh, a little bit. But, but it seems as though almost with the group still there, Jesus out of nowhere says, hey, Simon, son of John. Well, that got his attention. Not, hey, Simon. Not, hey, Peter. This is, hey, Kevin Allen. Yes, Lord. He says, do you love me? Peter answers quickly. You know, yeah, I love you. Feed my sheep. Hey, hey do you love me? Yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. Tend my lambs. Hey, do you love me? The text says that he was grieved in that moment, Peter, by the fact that the Lord had asked him a third time. I wonder what grieved him. Do you think he caught the symbolism? It's hard to catch symbolism in the moment. But do you think he caught it in the moment? That by the third question that Jesus was now parale uh, paralleling the denials of Peter? You think that he caught it? A lot of commentators like to make a great discussion here. There's some nuance that's going on in the, in the Greek language here, and different words are being used, and they, they like to bring that up, and, and I'm sure that's important. But you know what gets me about this passage? I think there's something far deeper going on than just nuance of language. I think Jesus in this moment is trying to get Peter to understand the depth of his love for him. Notice what the question is not. Notice the question that Jesus asks is not, hey, Peter, do I love you? Isn't that the question going on in Peter's mind? Isn't that the real question of Peter? Hey, I've messed up. Do you still love me? Isn't that our question? Whenever we walk away from God, whenever we sin, whenever we know we're not doing the right things, isn't that our question? How could God still love me? Knowing who I am, knowing what I've done, do you still love me, Lord? And yet Jesus didn't look at Peter and say, hey, do I still love you? That's what the mob boss would have asked, right? That's what he would have asked, almost playing with Peter like a pawn of, what am I going to do with you? In the same way I rescued you out of the water, I could sink you in it. In the same way I raised people from the dead, I could take you out of it. And yet that's not the question that's asked. Notice that's not the question that's ever asked. The only one ever doubting the love of God for us is us. Jesus always loves us. You never have to ask that question, Lord, do you still love me? He will never even ask it of you. Do you think I still love you? The hindrance between Peter's relationship with God is not God. It's Peter. The question is, Peter, do you love me? Are you still on board with me? Because I'm still right here with you. And what Peter doesn't know is, yeah, as you ran from me, as you denied me, in reality, I ran with you, and I was right beside you all along the way. It's true for all of us. It's, it's one of the bad news, is yet good news is of God, and that's bad grammar, but it's great theology. It's the concept of wherever you go, God is with you. He's with you. 
There's nothing hidden with God. Everything is seen. Everything is exposed. And that's horrific news because that means God knows more about your sin than you even know about yourself. But that's tremendous news because it means you can never get away from him. He's always right there beside you. It may feel like you've run from God. It may feel like you've drifted from God. And maybe you have emotionally, physically, psychologically, uh, spiritually. But the reality is as you've drifted away, God has been right beside you. You can't get away from God. He's right there. And so whether you're at the funeral home or in the hospital or whether or not you're in the empty bedroom and your spouse is no longer there, God is with you. Messed up in the midst of your addiction, strung out, hung over, wherever you are, God is with you. And so the question he's asking is, do you love me? And yeah, three times is this great symbolism and, and, and it's great theological fodder, but I think there's more going on than that. I think the reason Jesus asked this three times is to really begin to drive home into the life of Peter what's going on. It's easy to answer a question once, especially if you, you, you answer it the way you think it's expected to be answered. I remember growing up in Sunday school, right? The, the, God loved those Sunday school teachers when we were in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, right? I mean, they're faithfully every single Sunday trying to proclaim the gospel to us, and we are just a bunch of idiots, right? And so they're going to start the class now with a good discussion, just try to get everybody talking, right? And we feel the pressure that's on. And so they might even ask, hey, who won the ball game yesterday? And we, in the heat of the moment, say, Jesus, right? <laughs> that's just the way you're supposed to answer things, just whatever, Jesus, whatever it is, right? It's so easy to answer, do you love me, with yes. It's so easy to answer the doctor, hey, do you think you can take care of your ailing dad at home? Yes. It's so easy when the dad asks the college-aged daughter, hey, do you love him? Yes. But whenever you ask it again, it becomes a different story. Imagine if you and I this afternoon were passing in Walmart, and I've got my little list that Jenny has given me, and I got to get, like, if there's 10 items, I got to get nine. Nine out of 10 in our house is 100%. <laughs> it's 100%. So I got to get nine out of 10. So I'm going down the aisle, and Jenny's going, When do you go to Walmart? It's, it's an illustration, honey. Um, so I'm going down my list, and I pass you. And as we pass, what do I say? I say, Hey, how are you? What do you answer? Fine, fine, fine. fine good. But what if, what if I said, Oh, good, good, good? What if I, but what if I turned around and said, Hey, how are you? Well, even then you'd be tempted to say, oh, I'm good. But what if I stared you in the eye and I ask again, how are you? You see, the first time you answer it with a trite I just assume they want to hear Jesus or I want, I want to hear okay kind of answer. Uh, the second time is a little bit more of a defense mechanism of I know you want in my life, but I don't want you to come in my life because I might lose it right here in the middle of Walmart. But by the third time, you can't hide it any longer. The makeup begins to run. What's just below the surface begins to expose itself. And the pain that you were trying to lock away comes out with the third question. I think what's happening here is Jesus is trying to move past the surface. He's trying to remind Peter, we're okay. We're okay because the only question in our relationship ever is, do you love me? Because you know I'm always going to love you. And yes, you've messed up, and yes, you denied me, but you know what? Everybody did. And I died for you. And it's not, a case, it's not a case with Jesus and the disciples in the same way that it's not a case with Community Bible Church that we're going to be extremely gracious for those outside of our circle, but for those inside of our circle, we're going to be religious and judgmental. It doesn't work that way with Jesus. It doesn't work that way at Community Bible Church. The grace flows just as freely inside this room as it does outside this room. The, the grace flowed just as quickly to the disciples as it did through the disciples to everybody else. Everybody stands in need of Jesus' grace. And so I think Jesus asked the first time, and Peter said, of course. And he asked the second time, and Peter said, absolutely. Absolutely. And he asked the third time, and the text says Peter was grieved because I think in that moment Peter realized, I feel sorry that I even have to put my Lord in this position to extend this grace to me. 
And yet he will gladly receive it. And I think in that moment, the destiny for Peter was dramatically changed. Dramatically. Not in perfection. He would still get things wrong. We all get things wrong. But there was a core value that changed in this moment. When the, when the eyes of Peter were truly open to the grace of God, there was, there was something that changed within him so that that which he feared before, he feared no longer. And notice what the text goes on to say. Verse 18. Jesus follows up this conversation by tr- saying, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. This image of strength, of vitality of of defining our own direction. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. The writer helps us understand this by saying, this he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And, And so how do you respond to that? How do you respond? Peter, your life is about to change in a dramatic way. You've been this self-sufficient kind of powerful guy, but, but now that you're growing older, what's going to happen is your life is going to take on a different uh, direction, and in this end life, you're going to have to submit yourself to the will of other people. You're going to suffer now in a way that you haven't before. And the only response Jesus has to all of what he's saying is, and so, follow me. And what's amazing to me about Peter is he seems to accept it. Now, Jesus didn't go into into gory detail of what would happen. I find that interesting, and and it's true for all of us. He he might give us a glimpse of what the future might hold, but but he doesn't go into the details of what's going to take place because he desires from us faith to, to trust him in the midst of whatever situations and circumstances he leads us into. And so he's asking Peter to now walk into the darkness with his preview of things aren't going to be the way they used to be, and yet you don't know exactly what that means, but just follow after me. And so Peter goes. And don't miss the transformation that's taking place here. Peter goes into the unknown of of his likely death with a willingness, with a submission, with a trust in Jesus. When just a few days earlier, uh, he, he refused to stand by Jesus. Notice the transformation of his heart that has taken place here. What he feared the most was death. And now he can accept it. Now he can submit to it. His eyes and his life have been so dramatically transformed by the grace of God that what was his greatest fear has now been set to ease. But notice, notice how Jesus so often works. Faith so often does not ease our fears by taking us around our fears, but by walking us right through them. He, he, Jesus didn't say, all right, Pete, you're afraid of death, so I'm going to let you live for a really long time, then you're going to die in your sleep. Follow me. I think we all would say, okay. Instead, what Jesus said here to Peter was, you know that thing you fear the most? It's going to be your story. Now follow me. Peter said, okay. But how? How? It's because I think for the first time in his life, he truly experienced the grace of God. He had sinned before, but this one was pretty well known. This one was undeniable. This one was for everybody to see, and this one was dramatically wrong. And yet here, a compassionate Jesus still welcomes him back, cooks him breakfast, still communicates with him, still has that love for him. And having received the grace of God, Peter is now able to walk whatever path is before him. And I think that's true for all of us. To the extent that you and I struggle with accepting what comes our way, to the extent that you and I struggle with uh, with dealing with the situations and circumstances that we don't fully control, to the extent that we struggle with those things, it's evidence that we're not quite taking in the grace of God for what it is. 
You see, when you and I have our eyes open to the grace of God in that moment because we love him so much and his love has been made known to us in such a dramatic way, we have such a trust for him that we can then step out and follow him wherever it leads. To the extent you and I know God's love for us, we follow after him. But whenever we are struggling to follow, it's evidence that we are struggling to comprehend his love. And yet what happened to Peter here is he was restored. He was made right. He was returned in some way to his original state. Yes, there were consequences he couldn't undo. Yes, this was a story he could never erase. Yes, even to this day, we're still talking about his failure, but we're talking about it in a radically different way than we would otherwise if he would have just kept on running from God. And the same is true for you. It's true for me. Whether we have drifted slowly from God and just the methodical nature of living life or whether we have run for him in a dramatic way, we can all come back to him through repentance. And whenever we come back to him in repentance, he will restore us with his love. He will make us right. And yeah, here's what I love about the story. G, uh, Peter had questions. But I would, I would have asked different questions than what Peter asked, I think. I would have asked, hey, Lord, could you, could you clarify that other people are leading me around and dressing me? I don't think I like that part. But notice Peter's question. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. That's John. And don't you love how John describes himself in his own gospel? He's like a little brother, right, describing his parents' love for him. The one who had been reclining at the table close and had said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? It's a great human question, isn't it? Like we get everything settled between me and Jesus. And then I, I, I'm going to take time to ask one more question. Hey, what are you going to do with him? You can almost hear this desire for human fairness, right? Of, oh my goodness, if you're going to kill me, what are you doing to him? I mean, if, if this is the contract I'm about to sign with you, I want to hear about everybody else's. It's almost, it's almost like a child who, who gets his dessert and then looks over at his sisters and go, ah, her piece is bigger than mine. We all want to know what God is going to do with somebody else, don't we? But notice how Jesus answered it. Now Jesus is like the mob boss. Verse 22, Jesus said to him, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what's it to you? What is that to you? You know what Jesus just said here? Read between the lines. You know what he just said? It's none of your business. And I say that, I bet you I say that twice a day at my house. Not to Jenny. <laughs> Ella will ask, what's Silas' punishment going to be? It's none of your business. Silas will say, you know, Ella's not supposed to be, it's none of your business. And my communication with him in that moment is, hey, hey, buddy, you have a tough enough time obeying for yourself. You need to worry about you and let her worry about her. We have enough on our plate here. The task before you is difficult enough. You need to worry about you. You know what I think God would want to say to us today? You need to worry about you. You got enough on your plate. You don't need to be wasting time wondering what's God going to do with him. How long is God going to allow this sham to go on? How is he going to take this one down? How's he going to deal with this shame that's over here? We don't have time for that. The task before us is too great. Our own sinfulness is too much. Our own inability is too great. Our, our, our temptation to look at other things and be distracted away from Jesus is too much. We don't have time for anything other than Jesus himself and our own need to follow after him. And so we need to focus on that right there. What's God going to do with my ex-wife? Well, now he got personal. It's none of your business. What's God going to do to that boss that unjustly fired me? It's none of your business. 
How long is God going to allow that arrogant fool to keep on his way up? None of your business. The task before you is to follow God. No matter where you are, no matter what's going on within your own life, the task is to follow. And it's amazing to me that that every time that we ask a future question, God gives a present command. He doesn't answer it. God, what's heaven going to be like? It doesn't matter. Follow me. God, where's my end going to be? It doesn't matter. Follow me. God, who am I going to marry? Hang on. Just follow me now. God, how is this relationship going to make it? It it doesn't matter yet. Just follow me right now, right where you are. But what am I going to major in? Just follow me. But where am I going to live? Just follow me. But are they going to fire me? Just follow me. But how is this diagnosis going to come out? Just follow me. Am I going to live or die? Just follow me. Whatever future question you're asking today, it doesn't mean that it's wrong to ask. You can ask, but let me tell you about the character and the nature of God. Whatever future question you ask, you're probably not going to get an answer, but you are going to get a command, and the command is follow me. No matter what happens, no matter where it goes, no matter if the marriage makes it or breaks it, follow him. Uh, No matter if you struggle with that addiction forever or if you overcome it, follow him. No matter if your family leaves you or sticks beside you, follow him. No matter if your company rises or falls apart, follow him. No matter if your income rises or falls, follow him. No matter if everybody knows about your sin or nobody knows about your sin, follow him. No matter if this church explodes or if it implodes, follow him. Wherever you are in life in whatever situation and circumstance, you can hope for better things. You can pray for better things. You can beg for better things. You can desire for things to be different. You can work hard. You can do all those things. But wherever you are today, follow him. That's all Peter had to do. But he had had denied the Lord in so many ways. How was he to make that up? You don't have to make it up. You just have to follow in the moment. You know what amazes me about this story is with Peter and John. There could not be, I don't think, two men to have such similar stories, both disciples both walking with Jesus, both seemingly in the upper echelon of of what it means to be a follower of His, both right there, both fail Him in the midst of the crucifixion, both are right there after the resurrection and now are part of what's going to go on in the early church, both of them right there. And yet, they live these drastically different lives from this point forward. Tradition holds that John wouldn't live forever. But he'd lived for a long time. And it wasn't all easy. He was exiled into the island of Patmos, a punishment by the government, and yet a reward from God. Because while he was on that island at Patmos, God gave him a revelation that we still talk about today, a revelation that still confuses me today called the book of Revelation, a great reminder that in the end, God always wins. The story is told that he died as an old man on a deserted island. And yet Peter, Peter in just a few years, he, he, would, he would definitely help found the church. Clearly the promise of Jesus, upon this rock I will build my church, definitely came true. And yet in just a few years, Peter himself would be martyred for his faith. That which he feared the most came true. But notice, when he knew God's grace, that outcome was okay with him. God did not save him from death. God empowered him through death to glorify God. The story is told that as Peter went to be crucified, that he objected. But he objected not saying to the soldiers, hey, save me. He made a request. He said, I am not worthy of being crucified in the same manner of my Lord. Could you crucify me upside down? And the man who, out of fear of the possibility of death, denied Jesus and ran, now having been restored and having seen the grace of God, stood in the face of death and glorified God. God can restore you. If you've drifted from Him or run from Him, if everybody knows your sin or nobody knows your sin, There is a short road, and it is the same road for all of us back to God. We repent. We return to Him, and however we return to Him, He restores us, reminding us of His great love for us. And then He sends us on our way, and the only task before us is not to make up for what has gone wrong. 
The only task before us is to follow him in whatever outcome may be. Why do two people get cancer and one overcomes it and lives a lifetime, the other one dies? I don't know. But whichever one is true of you, follow him. Why do two people start in the same company and they rise to the same levels when all of a sudden one day one gets promoted and one gets downsized? I don't know. But whether promoted or downsized, follow him. Why do two people get married and they both have their deep struggles and yet one stays together and one breaks apart? I don't know. But married or divorced, follow him. Why is it that we can all sin, and yet for some, their sin, our sins are never really publicly known, and for others, they're cast in the headlines? I don't know. But whether unknown or known by all, follow Him. In every situation and circumstance of life, what God has called us to do is very, very simple. It's to simply follow Him today, trusting that He will take care of tomorrow. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me?